Hello, my name is Christoph Buhmann, and I've written a book which just came out. Here you can see it, the best we share, nation, culture and world making in the UNESCO World Heritage Region. Now what is this book about? It's about the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. You might have heard of it. That's a committee attached to UNESCO, the UN Special Agency. And what it does, or what it's known for mainly, is that it keeps the World Heritage List. That's the list of the most important culture and natural sites on Earth. All this is based on the World Heritage Convention, an international treaty that almost all states have signed by now. So once a year, the World Heritage Committee comes together and decides about the sites on the World Heritage List and also about the candidate sites that uh, aim to become World Heritage themselves. And uh, this committee has transformed. In 2009, it still took strict decisions, such as delisting uh, Dresden Elbe Valley, a German site where a bridge had been built without committee approval from the World Heritage List. But over the next years, it became soft. Nowadays, it's, it has become much easier to become World Heritage. And then afterwards, once something is on the World Heritage list, to keep conservation demands at bay. Why study this? Well, my motivation partly was linked with earlier research projects. I'd been studying cultural heritage in Japan, in Kyoto to be precise. And I'd also had an interest and had published on such things as the concept of culture and on globalization. Now the World Heritage Committee is the body that brings all this together. And what's even more interesting in a way for an anthropologist is the fact that it claims that the things on the World Heritage List have what is called outstanding universal value. Now we anthropologists are cultural relativists. We study cultures, but we do not believe in ranking them. So how does a global body go about the business of actually finding the things that have universal value for everyone on Earth. That was a really interesting question for me. I had also heard about complaints that the list was too Eurocentric. Too many palaces, cathedrals, historic town centers, too much European stuff, too little of the rest of the world. And already in the 1990s, this had led to efforts of reform. Such new categories were being introduced, such as, for example, cultural landscapes. And the first sites to become World Heritage under this new label were Oceanian sacred mountains or Philippine rice terraces. But before long, uh, the most common World Heritage cultural landscape became the European vineyard landscape. So in a way, the, uh, the problem with the Eurocentric perspective lingered. So I thought uh, I should go and study it myself as an anthropologist. So I went to five of the World Heritage Committee sessions between 2009 and 2015. And I did what anthropologists do, hang out, observe, chat with people, do interviews, study the documents, and uh, try to make sense from it all. So what was the most important result? Or what was the biggest surprise for me? What wasn't a surprise is that the nation state is so central in this global body. After all, the convention is between governments, between nation states, and the World Heritage Committee also has state members, 21 of them being elected by all, by all treaty states uh, for uh, 10 years or four years. The delegations of these states are often led by diplomats and that these diplomats often prioritize friendly relations to other countries over heritage conservation isn't a big surprise. But what I think others haven't seen quite so clearly is another thing that led to the transformation I, uh, I sensed, namely the fact that the north-south tensions and global inequalities hadn't been dealt with in an adequate way. When I arrived, I found a huge deal of dissatisfaction among delegates from the Global South and how the World Heritage List and the World Heritage Committee had treated them so far. And in 2010, this led to a kind of rebellion. The big states of the Global South, such as China, India, Mexico, Brazil, 
uh, banded together to basically overthrow the expert recommendations, the recommendations of expert bodies which were all headquartered in Europe. And this led to decisions that were more friendly to these countries. But the interesting thing I found is that that didn't lead to a more fundamental transformation. Basically, when China, India, Turkey, Iran and the like got what they wanted, more world heritage titles for themselves, they stopped there. They didn't press for a more fundamental overhaul of the world heritage system. And there I found close parallels to other global bodies, such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. These at pretty much the same time had also tried reform, had tried to become more inclusive and kind of involve the global south more, give it more weight. And that also went only half the way. So the big states, the leaders, they increased their weight, but they didn't press for a reform that would really also, let's say, say benefit the, the countries of Africa or others to, who were, weren't, who didn't have as much political and economic weight as, let's say, China or Mexico. That's the general storyline of the book. But I think beyond that, it also serves as an introduction to world heritage, to the history, to the way it's organized, to the conceptions that are being upheld in that arena, etc. And I think it also gives a little other funny details that uh, might be interesting for some of you. For example, the parallels to the canonization process of the Roman Catholic Church, that is the way the popes have produced saints. That also has become a lot softer and there's been a kind of an inflation. I think the parallels with uh, the World Heritage Committee are quite funny. But if you want to know more about that, I'm afraid you have to check out the book and read for yourself. Read on. Mm -hmm.